Ar-Rahmanir-Rahim Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasulihil karim Sayyidil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi You are all shepherds to your flocks and you will be responsible, you will be accountable for them. Muru awladukum bis salati wa hum abna'u sab'i sinin wa dhribuhum alayha wa hum abna'u ashrin. From the age, a young age, Deen has taught us the tarbiyat of Deen, preservation for the Deen, from the age of seven, teach them about Salah and not only teach them but command them, endorse it, make sure they secure their deen. وَفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَهُمْ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ Even with regards to their dunyawi preservation, Allah ibn Rushd has mentioned, يُفَرَّقْ بَيْنَ السِّبِيَانِ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ تِيلَ لِسَبْعِ سِنِينَ from the age of seven, separate children from their kids from their beds. So whether it's two sons, whether it's a daughter and a son, still two children need to be separated. And and some scholars have said at the age of ten. Afiz ibn Hajar Asqalani has mentioned. وَثَبَتَ مِنْ تُرُكٍ أُخْرَى أَنَّهُ يُشْتَرَتُ أَلَّا يَجْتَمِعُوا فِي لِحَافٍ وَاحِدٍ That from many um, avenues it has been established that they should not be under one cloth, under one blanket. So making separate beds completely separate for them if the demand and the taqaza of the time when the fitan increase and if we have to move to a younger age then do that if we have to separate them from rooms then do that if we have to have rules of engagement between brothers and sisters then do that but it's all about taking precautions and preparing so we our children don't have regrets we are answerable we are accountable to Allah and we will be liable and possibly punishable for our negligence so Deen has a balanced approach Allah and His Rasul have stipulated guidelines we may be having the best of rules, but we need the best followers as well. So even when taking children to task, a balanced approach, Monatani Rahmatullah used to say, if a parent, if a teacher is angry, upset, they shouldn't punish the child. You may cause zulm, you may oppress, there may be some brutality when your anger overtakes you. So whichever position Allah has put you in, you need to act responsibly knowing that you will be accountable to Allah. Oppression has different levels from a simple taking a, ta a child to task, a, a, a beating, to psychological abuse, to extremes of molestation etc. So we need to be vigilant of the signs Take for an example, a simple thing like a Ustad in a Maktab. So there was one student and the Ustad loved the student much. He was very humble. He was always obedient. He did his work on time. So other students were quite jealous of this one student and they decided to plot against him. So what they did was they circulated a story that the, some student's wallet was stolen and in the class now, the, a search needs to be done of his wallet. So when a search was done, the wallet was found in this most beloved student's just done. Obviously the boys planted it. Now we're talking of a maktab level. 
of oppression and zulm. The Ustad, Allah had given him wisdom at that point in time and he's seen through this plotting. So he, he, he made as if uh, that was discovered and, and that child was to blame and then he called him separately, then he called other boys separately. And then he interrogated the boy whose wallet was stolen and how was it stolen and when was it stolen and the stories didn't match and they were caught out. But if the Ustad was not vigilant, maybe he would have punished this boy, maybe he would have sent him to the office. Maybe this boy's reputation in Madrasa would be that he's, 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 he's a thief and his whole life he would be labelled and you could have destroyed the child's uh, future psychologically, mentally, in every aspect. So that would have broken the child. So a simple situation of just some boys trying to, to get their point across and that they did it innocently, but that innocence could cause what wreckage, what uh, damage and what ruin in this boy's life. So they didn't realize it and if the Ustad didn't uh, react decisively, then uh, this child would have been disturbed his entire life. So that was on the maktab level. Then if we look at another scenario where there was a student in Darul Ulum and uh, generally prizes are given at the end of the year. So this student was eligible for most of the prizes. So in, in, in the year where the prize is supposed to be given, then the Ustad looked and he seen that most of the prizes is going to this one student. So he said it won't look good. Let's just give the prizes so it's balanced to everybody else. Let's spread it out. So again, it is a Darulum scenario, but there is some form of oppression because who was worthy of that prize? In the next year, the Ustad looked at the outward system and he never investigated properly. So there was a prize for Ma'amulat, whoever excels in good deeds. So the student who was never there for any of the ibadat in Amal and who would struggle to even make it for Fajr, he got the highest score. Why? Because he filled in the mamulats on his own and it was inflated. The Ustad went by that without any investigation. Then the next year, the Ustad decided to make his own decision. And he chose randomly. But none of those prizes, the students were eligible for that. So on a such a high level institution, but the domain oppression was made. So the point being made is oppression has no limits and wrongs can infiltrate any system. Wrongs can infiltrate any person as well. We are not ma'asum. Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam wa ma'asum. And uh, there is room for permeation, there is room for corruption creeping in. Look at the Baytullah, there was a time where Tawaf was made of the house of Allah while they were naked. And the Bushrikeen had their idols, their gods in front of the Baytullah, so in front of your house of Allah, in front of your gods. But where had Shaitan taken them, to what level? So, as parents, whether it is the gardener, your children are at risk, not only girls, but boys. So sometimes a person will think, okay, it's a male gardener, but my daughters are at risk. No, your sons are at risk as well. We enter in an era of corruption, corruption to a level beyond comprehension. And uh, humanity are ready to exploit uh, and, and to take advantage of people. Likewise, we have domestic workers. We have had cases where a 15-year-old boy makes the domestic worker pregnant. And what was the story? He had access to pornography is to steal money from the parents, pay her money and say that if we have relationship, I will give you so much. So in our very homes, 
uh, other scenarios of uh, the husband having an affair with a domestic worker. So you get some domestic workers, it may be a fair complexion, light skin, pretty, etc. And they target husbands, they target people, households. So whether your children are going to a normal institute, whether they're going to maktab, whether they're going to a Darul Ulum, there is possibility of abuse and it is a ripple effect. If a child was abused, let's say he comes to this institute, he is prone to abusing other children as well. And this abuse will continue. And we've had cases of half students. Students have qualified and graduated as ulama and they were abused. What checks are in place in the darkness of the night at the, uh, when, 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 when the board in and the students are left alone in their rooms, what checks and balances, what has the management implemented to make sure there is no abuse? So from, from these institutes perspective, if pressure needs to be put and systems need to be put in place to make sure it is your child, it is your child, it is their future, it is your future, it is not dunya future, it's dunya and akhirah. We cannot go through the, 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 the topic is, 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 is um, gone beyond where we should be discussing, but this has been mentioned because it is a problem. So don't look at the name, don't look at the people behind it, don't look at the institute, look at what techniques and methodologies have been implemented to make sure it doesn't happen. Likewise, many a time the parent does find out, but there's a cover up. The institute finds out, there's a cover up. The institute finds out, but the people in charge don't know how to handle it. They expose the child, they expose the innocence, the name is leaked out, there's a trauma, there's other factors to consider. So it should not be that the places where Deen and Islam and the knowledge of Deen is supposed to be promoted, it's a breeding ground for vice. And don't look far, look at the, the Roman Catholic clergy and the, the scandals that have ravaged and wrecked uh, these institutes and how much criminal prosecutions and lawsuits have taken place. Let us take for example the USA. The majority of priests accused, which is 56%, have had one formal allegation. 27% two to three allegations. 18% four to nine allegations. And 3.5% have had more than 10 allegations. They've abused more than 10 kids. And then part of, of, of the disease is, and it's an aggravating factor, that the Catholic bishops continue to keep this, continue uh, to commit this crime because these crimes are kept in secrecy. These uh, bishops are reassigned to other posts, to other parishes, other positions, and they are left unsupervised. So even in an institute, in a dormitory, between students, how much supervision how oh, much precautions. Look at the, the lawsuits and victims have been paid an estimated plus, that's up to 2012, $3 billion. So complaints from around 17,000 people. So victims many, allegations around 11,000, priests around 4,400. We're just talking about the USA. This is approximately 4% of the priests who served during that period. And if we look at the abuse, then 81% were male, 19% were female. So you've got these uh, Catholic churches, uh, Christian uh, schools, Christian uh, Catholic schools, etc. 19% were female, 22% were younger than the age of 11. So, 
it's 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 pretty dominant. It's become vogue. So if we look at uh, just the Roman Catholic priests globally, around five hundred thousand. This is statistics of two thousand and eight. Then around 5,000, which is 1%, have been engaged in abuse. And half of the priests were 35 years of age or younger. Then, an interesting statistic, fewer than 7% of the priests who were engaged in this abuse have had experienced physical, sexual or emotional abuse as children. So we're saying the cycle continues. Husbands abusing their wives. Why? Because they're addicted to pornography and they want to do some certain acts uh, beyond human comprehension. We cannot comprehend. It's far beyond uh, sanity. Likewise, uh, sending your daughters, sending your children, sending your wives to these bogus armies. One is wealth, money, extortion. Secondly, is women are told to do certain rituals. It's, it's, it's haram, it is not permissible. Then our kids, so send them out with their friends, the rusks. It's, it, media has promoted and, and, and bombarded the minds, the schools, LGB. Uh, it's become the order of the day. So your daughter with her friend, a female, is at rusk. Cases beyond beyond statistics, personal experience, driving out of a town, a Muslim, predominantly Muslim town. And uh, as we were leaving that town, there was a vehicle behind me. And it was close range, not driving normal. Look at the rear of your mirror and see a girl driving in the front seat next to another girl. But she wasn't driving properly. And uh, this girl and the passenger was fondling and kissing the girl in, in, in the driver's seat. And she could not con concentrate on the road. Possibly, uh, we're going out, friends, she went to fetch her. But th they had some other relationship. Where they were going to, Allah knows best. This is just one of the situations which we personally experience, besides the cases. So, what steps are you taking? to ensure there is no abuse. So, as a parent, you have to be actively engaged in the child's life, look at the warning signs, and uh, your child should be comfortable to confide in you. So, some steps. One is, as a parent, show interest in their day-to-day -day lives. Ask them what they do during the day, who they did it with, who they did they sit with at lunchtime, what did they, games did they play uh, during lunch, after school, was there any physical contact, where was it, did they enjoy themselves, was there any abnormal uh, situations where they felt uncomfortable, then get to know people in your child, children's lives, where they, who they spending time with, whether it's children, whether it's adults, about the friends, about the parents of their friends, other people that they encounter, whether it's teammates, whether it's teachers, whether it's coaches, and uh, ask them questions so that uh, they, the children feel comfortable in confiding in you. Then choose your caregivers carefully, whether it is a babysitter, whether it's a new school, whether it's an after school activity, activity. We have to be very diligent and, and have, have screening systems. Then talk about certain incidents uh, of a certain child. This has happened. This violence happened. This is how they were abused. And ask your children questions. Have you heard of this? Have you seen anybody doing this to any child in your school? Has anybody uh, come close to you? Any signals? Know about the warning signs that, 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 uh, that you can identify in your child. Give them uh, to, 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 to speak up. And uh, when a child knows that their voice is being heard and taken, taken seriously, it will encourage them to speak up. So start having these conversations about feelings, about emotions. Tell them it's never too late. Teach them uh, about the boundaries. 
Whether they have a right, nobody has the right to make you feel uncomfortable. Whether it's a hug from a brother, a tickling from an uncle, nobody has a right and if you feel uncomfortable, it needs to be stopped. And when it starts, it gets more worse. They need to learn about their bodies and where's the limitations. As a parent, be available to your child. Don't be too busy. Let your child know they've got your undivided attention. They can come to you anytime. And the questions, the concerns, you will listen attentively. Let them know that by them confiding, they will not get in trouble. These perpetrators use uh, secrets, they use threats, they use rewards. Uh, remind them. Give them a chance to raise new topics and uh, give them an opportunity to have a uh, open-ended discussion as well. So we, Allah has, Allah has given us the understanding they are naive, they are, are young, they are adolescent. Uh, we, 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 we need to, to look after them from all angles. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve one and all. The amal for today is فَمَنْ تَوَضَّى فَأَحْسَنَ الْوُضُوْ خَرَجَدْ خَضَّايُهُ مِنْ جَسَدِهِ حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ مِنْ تَحْتِ أَغْفَارِهِ Making wudu properly, performing it with all the requisites, not rushing etc. That all his sins will be removed and obliterated even up to under his uh, nails. His sins will be forgiven. فَيُحْسِنُ هُذُوَهُ That's important to make hudu properly. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ